Watch more programs like this on cable and stream with PCN Select. Subscribe at PCNTV.com. I'm here with Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald. Thank you for being with us today. Good to be with you, Liago. So due to a recent uptick in COVID-19 cases in Allegheny County, you moved quickly to shut down things like in-person dining and drinking. Can you describe the new two-week order that was put in place to loosen some of those restrictions? Yeah, um, we're, we're one of the counties in the Commonwealth that has its own health department. So we do have a health department that has obviously some authority to do those type of things. So our health department director, Dr. Deborah Bogan, um, put an order in about a week and a half ago when we saw these numbers really start to rise precipitously and they've continued to do so. So she put an order in to close down certain activities, particularly bars and restaurants, because the contact tracing and the case investigation indicated that that's where these cases were coming from. We had been looking at cases per day in the teens, 15, 18, 17, boom, all of a sudden we were up in, into 100. We're now over 200 cases a day pretty consistently. So she and her team put this order in place um, and then extended it to even more things, uh, more gatherings, uh, those type of things. And you mentioned contact tracing. What, um, what do you attribute that rise in cases to mostly? Bars. We went into the green in early June. I think it was around June the 5th. And you know we were getting reports of, of people not socially distancing, not wearing their masks, being indoors, uh, being together, you know, shoulder to shoulder, very close uh, for hours at, at a time. And then the cases, which don't follow immediately, but, but take a couple of weeks to really see those numbers come up. Within a couple of weeks, we did start to see those numbers come up. And then the contact tracing traced it to the bar activity, mostly around young people. Most of the folks that, that, that the cases were uh, coming in were people in their 20s and, and, and early 30s. So uh, it's kind of the good news is that's a group uh, that, that don't have the, the, the same type of, of, of restrictions or, or potential for more severe health injuries as, as people that are, that are elderly. Um, but the fact is you still have to stop the spread. Otherwise, it will get into the elderly population. And after going from green to yellow and being open and now closed and this new order being put in place, what has been, what has been the response from business owners from this new order? Well, as you can imagine, the business owners that are affected would, would certainly not be happy about that. Um, and, and so there was about a week or so, week and a half, uh, in which most of that was shut down and no alcohol consumption, no dining except for takeout, those type of things. Uh, the health department director, uh, when the order expired, the, and it expires today, uh, issued a new order for two weeks, which will allow outdoor dining, which will allow alcohol uh, to be served up to three drinks. Um, they're going to close. Uh, 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 they're going to close in in restaurant dining uh, after eleven o'clock. I mean, on premises, still outdoors, uh, so you can still do takeout after eleven o'clock, but you won't be able to be seated. You have to be seated at these at, at the outdoor dining facilities. Uh, they put an order in that that no more than twenty five people could be in place in an indoor uh, facility, indoor gathering, and fifty people at an outdoor gathering. What is testing like in the county? Have you had to try to expand testing due to the recent surge in cases? There has been there has been an ex expanded uh, level of testing. Um, probably a month or so ago, we were probably testing in the, in the late neighborhood of 500 to 600 people a day. It's been consistently in the last week or so near 2,000 and sometimes above 2,000 tests per day. So the testing has gone up sig significantly as our cases have gone up, but also our percentage of positivity has gone up as well. We were typically running 2 to 3% positive um, when we were testing 500 or 600 a day. We're now at 10, 11 percent positivity. Uh, so it, the number of, of cases have gone up, but the percent positives have gone up too. We're also starting to see a rise in our hospitalizations, which you typically see uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, it's a lagging indicator. Those, you know, you have the tests that are higher. The hospitalizations haven't risen yet, but then a couple of weeks later, 
they start to rise and we're starting to see that as well. How are you working with the schools in the county and advising them to um, on what their plan should be for opening or not opening in the fall? Well, that's going to be a really big issue because I think all of us would like to see schools open up. That was a very or a severe method to, to, to shut down schools when, when the schools across the Commonwealth and quite frankly across the country were shut down uh, starting in mid-March. So I think parents and, and students and teachers and just everybody would love to be able to get you know, our kids back into school once the fall begins. The question is how? Uh, the logistics of doing that and keeping everybody safe, not just the kids, the, the students, but obviously the teachers, the staff, support personnel, parents, everybody that comes in contact and, and is, you know, part of the school system, as, which is such a major, major part of our, uh, of our activities all day long. Uh, we want to make sure that that happens. In, in Allegheny County, we have 43 school districts. Um, you know, some of them are pretty big. Some of them are pretty small. Some of them have resources to be able to do some things. Others, others don't. So the health department is, is working with them, advising them, giving them, you know, input. But uh, obviously, the, the, the ultimate call on this will become the state, the State Department of Health and the State uh, Department of Education, which will, you know, ultimately decide how, how schools and school activities can, can open up in the fall. Still weeks later, protests continue to occur across the state and the country for social justice. Um, is the county continuing to try to address the issues in Black and other marginalized communities over health disparities and other issues affecting them? Absolutely. And one of the, the things that Dr. Bogan and her team have done have really put a lot of testing, a lot of contact tracing, a lot of support services in underserved communities. And, and they've really done a good job uh, in making sure that that happens. So access to the testing, uh, you know, obviously information and, and, and education as all of us are trying to learn what is the best way to deal with this, uh, this pandemic. How do we keep ourselves safe? How do we keep our families safe, providing masks, PPEs, things like that. Uh, it's a challenge, I mean, because we also know that in, in, in primarily underserved communities, uh, particularly people of color, they, ha they have often have underlying health conditions that can also become, uh, you know, much more severe when you, when you co contract COVID-19, when you contract the coronavirus. So if you have other issues such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease, cancer, all these other uh, other diseases, having the coronavirus certainly puts people at risk, it, it, no matter what their age is. And then if you've got, you know, the, the senior population that also might have these things, uh, these underlying health conditions, and then they contract COVID, they really put themselves at risk in a, in a, in a serious way. So after, of course, Allegheny had this uh, recent uptake in cases, we're just coming off of the 4th of July weekend. Are you concerned about and uh, monitoring the possible effects that gathering from this past weekend will have on new cases? We, we are, and I think that's an important point that you make. Um, that was really one of the reasons I think Dr. Bogan uh, on Thursday put out the kind of emergency order shutdown to keep things uh, and also to get, get the word out that, you know, that the people need to be wearing their masks, even in the other activities that haven't been shut down or mitigated in any way, there's still significant um, operations that people need to have, whether it's an office operation, manufacturing, construction sites, even getting together with your family. I think, I think in, in Allegheny County, for many months, we had a very good uh, run of, of low numbers, low cases, low test results. And I think when we went into the green, I think maybe some people got a little bit of a false sense of security, thinking, oh, we're all done now, that you know, the virus is not really bothering us. This virus is here. This virus is not going away. So until we have a vaccine, until we have a cure or a treatment, we're gonna have to continue to be vigilant. We're gonna have to continue to wear our, wear our masks and we're, at, you know, we're near people when we're uh, you know, keep physically distant. The things that we've learned a lot about this disease in just a very short period of time. So uh, the 4th of July is one of those, we didn't have fireworks in most of our municipalities. We didn't have those type of, uh, we didn't have parades and festivals. And a lot of the things that, you know, we all look forward to uh, in the summer. Uh, you know, little kids on up to, you know, seniors love love the, the, the festivities that come around with our, our national celebration. But we realize that you know we, we've had a number of major holidays that have come about Easter and Passover back in April, and then Memorial Day weekend to kind of the kickoff of summer. 
and then the 4th of July. And, you know, so it, it's a new normal that we're all learning to live with. And we'll start to see some of those results if people did go out and uh, were a little bit careless. That, that usually shows up a week or two later in the test results. And that's one of the unfortunate things about this, this disease. You can't, you don't get the immediate feedback and the immediate data that says, okay, everybody behaved themselves on Sunday, so the test results were good on Monday. It takes a while for that to, that to, to flesh out. And finally, looking forward to the rest of the summer and the rest of the year and hopefully getting over this uh, new increase um, and shifting back to the green, what are the main challenges or concerns that you have moving forward? Well, you know, number one, trying to keep the economy open so that people can work People can earn a living. Businesses can 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 operate, uh, but doing so safely, and 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 that becomes a challenge because each activity has its own risk uh, associated with you know how they interact with people, how they they function in a, in a day on a, on a daily basis. So um, th- that's the challenge: the balance of of we want to keep as many things open as we can, but we also want to keep people healthy. And sometimes those things get in conflict with each other, and it makes it a very difficult decision whether it's made by uh, Secretary Levine at the state level or, or in our case, uh, Dr. Bogan uh, at the county level. Uh, these decisions are, are, you know, they try to use data, they try to use scientific information, and but you're also knowing that you're affecting people's lives in, in a very, very serious way. All right, Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald, thank you for your time. Thanks, Leo. Good to be with you. Take care. Good day. Join our guests for insights on issues impacting local government and the citizens of Pennsylvania. Created by the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs, Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs connects you to legislation and policy that will affect you and your family. Your host, Chris Kapp, and his guests discuss current affairs that matter to you most. Connect with your state by tuning into Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs on Sundays here on PCN. I'm here with Jim Tyrell, Philadelphia International Airport's Chief Revenue Officer. Thank you for being with us today. It is my pleasure. So with COVID-19 affecting travel all over the world, what are some of the ways that uh, one's travel experience at PHL uh, is different today? Well, As people come to the airport these days, they will notice um, some very visible differences um, to the facility. Um, So our main goals in welcoming our guests are to keep them safe and healthy and um, make them comfortable with coming to a facility by giving them more control over their journey, which is very different from the way we've treated guests previously. Um, So when they come to the facility, the first thing they'll notice is a sign on all of our doors that um, advises everyone coming to our facility they must wear a face mask, some kind of facial facial protection, in order to access the facility. That goes for all of our guests as well as all of our employees. Um, So everyone who comes to our facility is is expected to have a face covering while they're here. Um, We have also um, taken many... um, made many efforts in trying to keep our um, distances safe. So we have uh, floor decals throughout our facility, as well as other signs reminding people to um, keep that social distance. Anywhere where you would expect people to gather, whether it's a queue line for TSA or, or a queue line to get food or to board an aircraft, you will see um, reminders of, of that um, social distancing requirement throughout our facility. Um, we also have many signs, digital signs, as well as um, overhead announcements. Um, because again, <clears throat> one of the things we want to do is is make sure that our guests are comfortable and they feel safe when they're in our facility. And uh, through painstaking research, we have found um, that the one thing will cause people, our guests, a little stress is when they get into a crowded situation. Um, and sometimes you just can't help that in a, in a facility like an airport. So we do our best to, to try and make sure that um, we provide those cues to all of our guests to, to keep that in the forefront of their minds. 
Are there still food and other dining options available in the terminals in the airport? There are. Um, <clears throat> so um, since the days of mid-March when the pandemic really hit our airport very hard, um, in mid-March we had uh, 12 concession locations open at all times. I mean, again, we've always had employees here. We didn't have very many guests, um, but our food, our food and um, beverage and retail program consists of about 165 stores throughout the airport. So in mid-March, we went down to about 12 open. Today, we are at about um, 50 plus, um, to put it in perspective. So we have uh, just about a third of our total program open and operational at this time. Um, and again, that it, it's all based on the number of passengers that we have coming through our facility. Um, to really put it in, in perspective, on April 20th of this year, we had 62,000 guests. Um, April last year, we had 1.3 million. Um, so, um, and again, on April 20th of this year, our concession program recorded about $750,000 in sales where April last year on the same, the same month was 19 million. Um, so the volumes have, have dropped considerably. Um, and what has been the general financial impact on uh, Philadelphia International Airport and the kind of air, airline industry in general? So <clears throat> one of the things we um, figured out very early on in this crisis is that we were going to have to grant relief to all of our business partners and our stakeholders. Um, so what exactly did that mean? Um, very early on in this, in this pandemic, we, um, we deferred all rental payments for all of our airlines during the three month period between, um, April and June. And what we did was any rental payments that the airlines would have incurred through using our facilities or landing aircraft here, we've deferred those payments now until the last quarter of this calendar year. Okay, so for our airline partners, they didn't have to pay any rent or any fees for the three months that were really the hardest uh, to deal with during this pandemic. For all of our concessionaires, those 165 store owners who operate concessions in the airport, we also deferred any payments um, because they were closed. Um, typically in airports, the agreements between airports and concessionaires have a minimum annual guarantee built into the agreement whereby regardless of the volume of business that they do, they guarantee to, to pay a minimum of X amount of dollars. And usually that's thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, depending on the size of the store. We've waived all of those minimum annual guarantees and we've done that again, throughout the remainder of this calendar year. But we also deferred any payments that would have been due to us for that same three month period, April, May, and June. So essentially for that three month period, the airport generated zero dollars. We've deferred payments for all of our business partners, hotel, rental cars. We opened our garages to free parking because we didn't want to subject our guests or our employees to having to ride a very crowded shuttle bus. So we opened up our garages and we said, okay, guests, okay, employees, free parking for April, May, and June. So we made zero revenue from parking. Um, we literally generated zero revenue for those three months. Now, it costs us a little over a million dollars a day just to operate the facility. So nobody came to us and said, okay, airport, we understand you're having a tough time. You don't have to pay us. We still had to make all of our payments, including our debt service payments. So that's where uh, the CARES Act came in. The federal government gave airports a relief program. Well, Philadelphia was lucky enough to get, I think it was $116 million. And that carried us for that three-month period that we didn't generate any, any revenue. So now going forward, the airlines will begin as of July 1st to make rental payments. Our concessionaires who are open 
will pay us a very reduced percentage of the money they generate in terms of sales. We've reduced all of their contractual requirements. Remember, we waived the minimum annual guarantees. We've also lowered the percentages that they're going to pay us because it is very difficult to operate in an airport with the kinds of activity we're seeing today. I mean, we're still less than 50% um, of passengers, well less. So um, the airport is, is suffering financially. We have had to defer many of our capital projects. We put on a hiring freeze. Um, we will probably have some layoffs in the, in the not too distant future. Um, because again, the way Philadelphia operates, um, we're what they call a residual airport. So essentially what that means is we're a break-even facility. The airlines agree to pay all of the costs associated with operating the airport. But the airport also has to generate revenue from non-airline entities to reduce those costs. Um, and, and we're not doing that. So we also have to keep those costs relatively stable for the airlines or they're going to choose not to serve Philadelphia. So it's it's really hard balancing act for us. Um, and we've, we've had some really good discussions with our airline partners going forward. Our new fiscal year began July 1st, and we have calculated rates and charges going forward for the next six months that, um, that the airlines have found acceptable. Uh, you mentioned your relationship with the airlines. Uh, PHL recently started a, an airline incentive program. Can you describe what that program does? We did. So to the best of my knowledge, we were the first airport in the country, if not the world, to come up with a COVID-19 air service incentive policy um, where the goals of those incentives are to bring back the service that we had and, oh, by the way, bring it back sooner rather than later. Um, typically, air service incentives are for new service to new destinations or by new airlines. We have, and, and we have a brand new air service director who, who developed this policy, and she's kind of phenomenal, and she's being sought after by airports around the, the country to find out how she did it and what she did. And, um, but anyway, um, we've had some really good responses from those partners who have had to discontinue service, like all of our foreign flag carriers and American Airlines, who operates the predominance of our international activity, um, who can't operate international service from Philadelphia today because of either travel restrictions or the fact that we're not a funneling airport and we can't receive flights from the majority of, of the international destinations that Philadelphia previously served. Um, so anyway, the, the, uh, the response from the airlines has been really positive. A lot of airlines have agreed or will have told us they will agree to return service to Philadelphia sooner rather than later based upon the lifting of the travel restrictions. And finally, um, you know, we just mentioned that um well, we're just coming off of the uh, 4th of July weekend, which is usually a big travel weekend. And you just mentioned that uh, travel passenger volume just isn't what it used to be. Uh, what are your predictions for travel trends for the rest of summer and the rest of the year? Well, that's, that's a tough one. Um, so we have actually done three separate scenarios that we've used to develop rates and charges projections for the year. Um, we've done a low, middle, and high um, range. Um, based upon early activity, and by the way, we've done all our budgets based on the low, low projections. We do not want to be in a position where we under, under collect. So we don't want to think we're going to be back to normal anytime really soon. So we've budgeted on the low scenario. Um, Based on recent activity with our low cost carriers returning service levels to Philadelphia, that really surprised us. And specifically that's Frontier, Spirit, um, American has jumped in and it's been a, a lot of service to destinations like in the Florida area or, or Texas or Carolinas. Those areas that are now 
developing hotspots. So while we've seen service rise in tremendous volumes to Florida and, and service levels really follow that, that demand, we're not sure where that demand goes next month. Um, we think that some of that service, there will be a retrenching and a, and a, uh, uh, the airlines will have to pull some of that service, but we've been really, um, it's been very optimistic for us seeing the levels of passengers in the facility today. And, and in fact, American Airlines just um, implemented a new schedule as of today where they've added about 60% more capacity um, over the previous schedule that was um, coming through Philadelphia. So um, their levels are back to, I think it's 232 flights a day, if I'm not mistaken. 232 flights a day um, is their new schedule with loads up to the 50 or 60% mark. So we're seeing a nice increase. Um, we originally thought that we would be back to about 50% of 2019 levels by the end of this fiscal year. Um, we think that's probably a good estimate. And that's in terms of passenger volume, not financial um, returns. We won't be back financially for a few years. All right. Jim Tyrell, Philadelphia International Airport Chief Revenue Officer, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure, Laga. Thank you. PCN brings you the PIAA Championships in a variety of sports. From the field to the pool and the court to the track, PCN brings you the best scholastic teams competing on the state's biggest stage from all the best angles. With multiple cameras, instant replays, and professional commentary, we take high school sports and elevate them to new heights. Watch on cable and the PCN app. PCN, proud to bring Pennsylvania sports to you. I'm here with Dr. James Coyle, Professor of Communication Science and Disorders at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Thank you for being with us today. And thanks for having me. So for people who have had very severe cases of COVID-19, what are some of the rehabilitation services that they may need as they recover? Sure. Um, well, they'll probably split into a couple of categories. Uh, physical rehabilitation, which is, you know, increasing mobility, getting people moving again is uh, a huge part of this. In fact, it's a huge part of helping the second uh, uh, system, the respiratory system, recover as well. Uh, so we typically have pulmonary rehabilitation and physical rehabilitation. Um, uh, among the areas of pulmonary rehabilitation that are important in, in my field especially are those involving swallowing and speech. Uh, given that the respiratory system is primarily affected uh, by the disease, uh, people on ventilators uh, have their respiratory systems compromised and kind of taken over by ventilators. So we're uh, closely involved in the restoration of breathing and speech functions, but swallowing as well uh, in people who are recovering from this disease. And for those who had cases that were so ser serious they needed to be on a ven ventilator, what does that recovery process look like? Um, I mean, the process is similar across um, the spectrum of people who develop res sudden uh, uh, inflammatory respiratory failure, that is severe cases of pneumonia. I mean, this is, despite the fact that this particular virus behaves very differently inside the human body, uh, the, uh, you know, coronavirus is, is, a, is a class of viruses that cause respiratory tract infections. And so the process involves, once the patient is capable of breathing independently without a ventilator, um, increasing the patient's ability to take back over the workload of breathing. Uh, and depending on how long the patient has been dependent on a ventilator, which basically means they haven't been using any of their breathing muscles, uh, and depending on the extent of damage to the alveoli and lower airways, uh, the process can take longer or shorter. Um, for example, in older people, there's just naturally a longer recovery period from these kinds of, you know, um, severe illnesses. Um, so there are a lot of different factors that come into play. You mentioned the class of COVID-19. What is it about uh, COVID-19 specifically as an infection that makes it spread so easily and cause so much damage to people's respiratory systems? Well, um, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask that question to, but um, the, the point I think is that this particular virus is much more tenacious in terms of how easily it infects people. Uh, it's much more transmittable in terms of how easy it is to spread to others. And, and it seems to take hold in um, cells and other tissues that um, 
tend to shed viruses more more easily or tend to not be as affected as easily. So I don't think it's uh, that it's a, that it is a coronavirus so much as that it is a particular type of coronavirus opportunistic infection that has learned how to um, take hold and really plant plant their flags and kind of colonize the human body very well. Uh, you mentioned age plays a role in people's recovery mm-hmm. process. What are some other factors that uh, contribute to people maybe having um, exper- experiencing recovery challenges? Uh, well, there are um, what we call comorbidities. Uh, comorbidities are other diseases that people have at the time that they catch you know, something else. Uh, and so specific comorbidities involving cardiopulmonary or respiratory function are known to severely increase the risk of mortality, of course, and of longer term illness and more severe consequences of the disease. Um, I'm also reading, and again, I'm not a a public health person or an epidemiologist, but I'm also reading that there are uh, certain effects um, on the uh, blood cells and vascular system. Uh, And we're also seeing that unlike some other diseases, uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus seems to somehow have effects on cerebral brain function uh, over the course of the disease. And we're seeing some interesting, in, in my field where we do language and cognitive restoration and, and whatnot, uh, we are seeing some very interesting patterns of cognitive impairments in people recovering from uh, this disease. In a recent uptick in cases of coronavirus, it's revealed that a lot of young people are being infected. Can rehabilitation, such as the, the cognitive rehab and the uh, speech and respiratory, things of, of that sort, help prevent permanent damage, or is it also inevitable even in young people? Um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you asking whether uh, people who are younger would have less severe cognitive and physical impairments afterwards? or if the process of restoring those functions are, are different. So uh, if, as more young people are being infected, mm-hmm. will, um, will their need for rehabilitation uh, ah. be lower or higher? Sure, I understand, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, what, I, um, what I see going on is that uh, younger people tend to have less severe infections and consequences of infections than older people, and it goes right back to what we discussed earlier. Uh, Younger people do not have any conditions of aging, and conditions of aging are typically comorbidities. Uh, So they have much more physiologic reserve and can bounce back much more easily from things like this, uh, whereas older people obviously have consequences of aging. So uh, in in general, generally speaking, yes, there is a very different pathway, but I would argue that the pathway is probably more stretched out and prolonged in older people than it is in younger people. Um, I think it's the the hospitalization itself is is a big factor. Um, so the overwhelming majority of people who catch this uh, disease are recovering without needing hospitalization, um, which is a good thing. That means they're not severely involved enough to require you know, care in a hospital. Uh, and hospitalizations among older people are going to be higher, and naturally there will be more of them in hospitals, so requiring longer periods of recovery. So I think age is a real benefit, and uh, unfortunately I think that that is maybe one of the reasons that younger people feel kind of immune from the effects of the disease um, because uh, th- their, their likely mortality rate is much lower. The problem with that logic is for that person to go out and about and enjoy their um, freedom or whatever it is that they, that they want uh, is kind of depriving the same freedom of older people who would like to be doing the same things but are afraid to go out and do them. A lot of these uh, rehabilitative services that we're talking about are, are usually quite hands-on. Uh, how are caregivers and healthcare providers able to uh, give that care while still you know, keeping their risk low and protecting themselves? Yeah, it's a real challenge. I mean, uh, you know, in the hospitals, first of all, at UPMC, uh, many clinicians, uh, w- what's done is a s- staff are assigned to certain areas and clinicians who have already been well-trained and experienced in managing the patients with COVID-19 are, are managing them. And so they are using additional p- personal protective equipment. And in, in my field in particular, where just about everything we do speech, swallowing, uh, when we're testing, swallowing, people can cough. All of these are aerosol generating, you know, procedures. Uh, And so we, uh, when we're seeing COVID positive patients, we are using extra precautions, including PAPR suits, which have, you know, internal ventilatory uh, mechanism to keep the gas in the room outside of the gas that the, that the uh, clinician is breathing. 
so it's very different. Um, however, I was on the floors on Monday at, at, up at Presby, and really, other than you know having to wear a mask continuously, the the, the management of patients was really business as usual. And as cases continue to increase or continue to appear, uh, the demand for a lot of these rehabilitative uh, services is going to continue to increase. Do you think hospitals are prepared for an increase in demand? Yeah, actually, I, I do believe so. Um, the uh, in, in my particular area where we're doing communication, uh, restoration of communication disorders, uh, telepractice has really come to play now as an important adjunct to what we've been doing. And it's kind of a I mean, I always like to look for silver linings. Uh, this whole uh, pandemic situation has uh, led to the need for more telepractice. And we've been striving to get telepractice kind of institutionalized in our field. Uh, and so we're doing a lot more telepractice with people who have communication disorders that may arise from prolonged mechanical ventilation. And then from the things that we typically deal with, such as stroke, neurological injuries, and other, other conditions that cause communication disorders. And finally, what are you and your other colleagues in your field most concerned about moving forward as the, the virus continues to spread and continues to exist? Yeah, uh, it's a great question because, uh, you know, people in, in my kind of job, are, we, we are a two-headed snake. Uh, you know, we're clinicians and scientists, but we're also teachers. And so, um, you know, I and my colleagues are dealing with the issue of reopening a giant university. With, with tens of thousands of students and faculty and staff and whatnot, um, uh, we're in, in that domain, we're very concerned about giving the best quality education to our students. Uh, you know, uh, educational models uh, include such things as distance learning and remote education, which I think works in certain, certain things. But, you know, it's really difficult to teach human anatomy, uh, you know, over the Internet. Um, we have a software that can simulate a cadaver dissection and, and, and things like that. But it's very difficult to engage students and to deliver content remotely in, in many cases. And on the, clinic, on the clinical side, we worry about spikes, ups and downs of, uh, of, of caseloads because it really strains the system. Uh, you, you saw what happened earlier with the uh, depletion of PPE so quickly, and that was without the public buying it or, you know, there was no hoarding going on. It just was, there just wasn't enough of it to go around because we were using so much of it. So these things really concern us because without the PPE, we're unnecessarily exposing ourselves to greater risks. All right, Dr. James Coyle, Professor of Communication Science and Disorders at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Thank you so much for your time. You bet. Thank you.